If you follow a regimented bodybuilding program for three months or so, you can look way different. The first year or two is an amazing thing. You don't even need to worry about main gating because for the most part, you're gonna be gaining muscle and losing body fat. I think a lot of times you're gonna like look a little fatter just for momentarily. You do wanna to try to figure out what are the amount of calories that I should be consuming. I just didn't have it in my genetics to develop my weak points. I just thought, well, if this guy's I mean, worried about drink. genetics, we're all. Yes. <laughs> I'm ready. <laughs> I was on a run last. <laughs> I really hate dogs. <laughs> I, I can cut that part out. <laughs> nah, nah, keep it in. I want people to see how fucking disgusting you just, are. Keep that shit in. <laughs> I'm not disgusting. I burped a little bit. <laughs> You guys ready? Okay, let's <laughs> <laughs> throws up on the microphone. Let's just get back to the, the show the way that it really is. Let's be serious. Uh, let's pause for a moment while I set up to fart on the microphone. Thank you. Yeah, yes, exactly. All right, so you let out a good squeaky one. You were doing your little, your little running. Again? Yeah, running around like a fairy. Again. <laughs> I'm happy you said fairy. I know every time you guys uh, hear me say that, you just want to like break my arm or choke me out. But. <laughs> That's what I like to do, okay? Well, I like to be hate. independent. Yeah, good. And uh, anyway, I've been running at night, and it's been kind of fun, you know, switching it up because it is chilly in the morning. Mm -hmm. I would say cold, but then people get mad because they're like, it's California. How cold can it get? It's cold for us. I don't know. It just feels cold. It's not chilly at night, though? Uh, it's No, it's like, it's like more manageable. It's like 50 or something. Because I don't go at night night. It's like I go like... At like six or something. You're also not fresh out of bed though. Yeah. Right. Yeah. When you first wake up. <sighs> yeah. yeah. You wake up and the body's stiff and hopefully something else is a little stiff. Hopefully. It should and be. And it's a little bit chilly outside. You know what I'm saying? So mm -hmm. yeah, I've been running at night, but it's been feeling good. And um, I run over by like Aggie Stadium and that's kind of cool. I don't know. There's just like, there's some cool energy about a stadium. I don't know what it is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But the lights are on. It just mm -hmm. looks cool. There's not even anybody really doing anything over there, but I don't know. I'm digging it. That's sick that they keep it open. Usually they lock those things up. I know. I know. Davis, they leave everything open. They got the track open over there. So I'll sometimes go over to the track and hit a lap or two, but I hate running on a track. Mm. It's like too, mm. too serious. Just going you know? in a circle. And then I also get reminded of like how slow I actually am because <laughs> it's like, you know, it's so actually much. measured. I can't like lie to myself about how far <laughs> I'm going. Yeah. But I like running outside and I like running uh, places where there's just more stuff, you know, because I'll sometimes I'll stop and I'll do squats. I'll stop. I'll do push ups. I'll I'm trying to move around more because I noticed that, um, you know, for through my powerlifting career, that made me really stiff, maybe because I didn't follow up with a lot of other movement stuff and uh, my body just got super stiff and tight from that pro wrestling was kind of the same thing it's like i would end up you know getting off the couch in slow motion and i would be kind of in pain and then um you know trying you know doing mess around with some bodybuilding kind of same thing like you tend to over or i tend to overdo it and uh it would just you know getting up out of a chair or going upstairs like is hard you know when you're training hard and then i found myself doing the same thing with running and i'm like ah let me Okay, I got the foundation down. Let me dial it back a little bit. So I haven't been running as far. I haven't been running as often. I don't run every day. And when I'm running, I'm trying to like just move around more. I'm like, this is so boring just to completely run straight. Yeah. So let me like veer off this way. Let me run up this hill. Let me run up these stairs. Let me stop and do some squats and stop and do some push-ups and stuff like that. But when it comes to context, when you say, yeah, I've been running as far, because like, yeah, there'd be days you'd be doing 10-mile runs. What mm -hmm. is it like? Four, five, six mile runs? Yeah, I'd probably run um, just like anywhere between 40 minutes and like 90 minutes, somewhere in there. Okay. And that sometimes is included. Uh, there's also like a warm up in there, which is like a walk jog. Mm -hmm. So that might be like 10 minutes of the exercise for the day. Like last night felt really good. So I was out for like an hour and 20 minutes. Yeah. But yeah, a lot of times it's like, I would say most of the time it's probably rated right like an hour. Cool. How's that effect been on your lifting? It's been feeling great. And that's the other thing is that it's allowing for more energy to lift. It's allowing for more energy for the diet, which is weird, right? But I have more energy to put into my diet, more energy to think about my nutrition and more energy to like not eat shit that's not good for me. 
or not eat shit that doesn't align with what I'm doing because I'm not so drained. I feel like if I was drained and more stressed, then I would probably be easier for me to make bad decisions. Mm. You probably also have like, you probably also burn more calories. So those bad decisions, they'd still hit, but they mm -hmm. wouldn't hit as bad. Right. But I get what you're saying. When you, when you tie yourself out a lot, it is much easier for you to just be like, ah, let me just door dash tonight. <laughs> right. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. When you burn the candle at both ends and you kind of just, I, you also feel this sense of like victory or like celebration. Mm -hmm. Like I did a lot today, mm -hmm. you know, and you're like, I'm just going to kind of go for it and order sushi. Not that there's anything wrong with sushi. Sushi is delicious. I'm having some sushi tomorrow night. Oh, nice. So I'm excited for that. But yeah, I've been, been able to just to keep everything on point and uh, I'm going to get a body fat test done soon and check in on that and see where it's at. I'd like to just for the hell of it, like to get it down to like, six or seven percent i don't know what that'll take or i don't know where i'm at now so mm -hmm. <laughs> just check on it and go from there what do you think you're at now my guesstimate is 10 to 11 percent. what do you think that sounds probably accurate mm -hmm. i think it's you know it's hard as you um like if you try to lose weight um you might be messing up your percentage which i think that people don't think about very often but you know if you make sense if you were to lose like 10 pounds some of that's going to be muscle and uh, just because you lost 10 pounds doesn't mean that you lost 10 pounds of fat. Yeah, mm -hmm. lost 10 pounds of fat doesn't mean you necessarily got yourself a lot leaner. So mm -hmm. uh, it'd be interesting to see and uh, just kind of go from there. Yeah. But some of y'all are focused on getting bigger. Like we talk a lot about fat loss, a lot about fat loss. But, you know, for, for everyone that's trying to like gain some muscle <laughs> and get bigger, we got to get into you guys. We got we to gotta help you all out because... There's some certain things I think some people are really forgetting when mm. it comes to getting big and when it comes to lifting to get big that it's just, uh, you should know. We have a friend yep. that just started to like focus on peak contraction and just started using tension mm -hmm. and he's noticing, oh God, I can I can pop my pecs. And it's <laughs> just like, man, if you've been doing it. Like, and, and the thing is, it's cool because he's going to be able to see a lot of muscle gain within mm -hmm. the next six months. But this is something he just started adding into his training. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised to see like, just traditional bodybuilding um, in 2024 be like a huge thing. You know, somebody <laughs> somebody just like popping off about three sets of 10 and how effective it is and, you know, three uh, exercises per muscle group. And, the longevity people are going to get on it. Yeah, nine to 12 sets per body part per week type of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, it wouldn't surprise me to see people get really hyped up about it. But, you know, we've been talking about the importance of bodybuilding for a long time because – you can utilize those methods forever. Yeah. It's a method that you can, you can utilize some bodybuilding forever. And it doesn't matter if you're a jujitsu athlete, a football player, a power lifter, a bodybuilder, it doesn't matter what you do. You can always implement some forms of bodybuilding. Um, even for somebody like, uh, you know, you hear someone that trains with kettlebells a lot. Well, they could just simply, even with the kettlebells themselves, they can implement some bodybuilding rules. So for example, they could slow down the tempo. They could do three sets of 10 of like a goblet squat, try to get tension wherever they want to on their quads, go within that range of motion, get a lot of blood into the area, use short rest intervals. But there's a whole other side of bodybuilding that's not really talked about either. Is like the food is a huge part of it. And I would say that I've only seen... I've only seen really drastic changes in people, like physically seen drastic changes in people when they either took performance enhancing drugs or they just took their nutrition really seriously one way or the other. They either decided to bulk and go all in and they're like, hey, man, I'm going to gain 40 pounds and I'm going to let the chips fall where they may in terms of the body fat percentage and in terms of gaining fat and gaining muscle. And I'm just going to go for it. Um <clears throat> So I think it's, you know, trying to, trying to be somebody that is trying to think about wanting to augment your body or trying to get a little bit bigger or even just trying to have a better body fat percentage, like what I'm talking about. I might have to shrink down for a little while and see uh, when my luck runs out with that. And then I might have to go the opposite direction. And then it might be like, okay, let me implement more food. Let me walk around like a bodybuilder and have some prepped meals and eat some more carbohydrates and kind of see what happens. Cause I could gain muscle that way. You gotta be careful though. Uh, I mean, you gotta be careful 
how much carbohydrates and how many calories you're eating when you're bulking. And even though like we we talk shit sometimes on uh you know on tracking, if you're if you're trying to get bigger and you're not trying to just get fat, right? You do want to try to figure out what are the amount of calories that I can that that I should be consuming. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like that's where you know you can go to that precision nutrition calculator or whatever, and you can just get an estimate. And when you like weigh and track your food. You can only maybe need to do that once. And then you can just eat a lot of those things continuously right. every single day. But the thing is, is like when you start trying to get bigger and you're eating a gram per body weight of protein and you have your fats and your carbs at a certain place, you don't want to start having the excuse of, okay, I can have a bowl of cereal here. I can have this here. Because you might see some guys, like Sam Sulek is great and he's super regimented on his diet, but you know he'll do, he does have a lot of calories and he'll have his mm-hmm. chocolate milk thing. I don't know if it's a whole gallon, but you know he's done that before. But mm-hmm. if a guy tries to imitate that and he's not, on PEDs where his metabolism is a lot higher and he's just like, you know, he's just trying to handle it. Even nutrition. PEDs aside, Sam Solich just has a tremendous amount of muscle. And he has like, mm. he, and he trains right. hard. Right. So his, he, like he's burning a lot of calories. So even if someone was natural and they had that amount of muscle mass, they're going to be burning through calories left and right. They will be able to. But the thing is, is most guys aren't there. Right. Mm-hmm. So most guys aren't going to be able to drink the gallon of chocolate milk and right. it should act, and it will actually fit into their calories. So what I'm saying is like if you try to imitate some people, you don't have the muscle, you don't have the metabolism to do that. You can still eat carbs. You could still eat these foods, but you can't handle as much as they can. Because if you do and you do that on a daily basis, you'll gain some muscle, but you'll also gain a lot of fat. So you do want to you do want to find the amount that you should be eating every day and kind of stick to that over time. What are you, what is uh, your guys' thoughts on? Because um, uh, uh, like Greg Doucette will talk about like main gaining. Like he won't say he doesn't believe in uh, like bulking and then shredding. He just fl- believes that like I think this is what he believes at least that um, if you just eat in a caloric surplus, but not like in a huge freaking surplus to gain fat. But if you just kind of maintain a little bit more than what your your maintenance level is, that you'll get bigger and you won't have to worry about like quote unquote like bulking and cutting. I think a lot of times you're going to like look a little fatter. You're going to like look a little puffier, but you got to just make the decision to do it. And you have to understand that you're going to like look that way just for momentarily. Not everyone reacts that way, but a lot of times you might be like, man, what's that guy doing? Like his face kind (laughs) of face, you know, gain gain some weight in the face. And you might be gaining weight in places that you don't like because unfortunately the places that are your stubborn areas that you lose weight in the uh, last you also gain weight first in. <laughs> so so it might suck and you might feel self-conscious about it, but it's something you just have to, if that's what you're working on for the moment and you're trying to gain muscle mass and you're trying to gain strength, then it would make sense to have a surplus of calories, a surplus of nutrient for that period of time. And hopefully, hopefully what you're doing is the same thing with when you're losing weight, you're trying to hold on to as much muscle mass as possible while losing the most amount of fat in the reverse form, when you're trying to bulk, you're trying to gain the most amount of muscle, but we're still trying to, you know, hold off on the fat. Like we don't, I don't think there's anybody that's really desiring to gain. Maybe there's an offensive lineman, a football player that like is a young guy and he weighs 220 and he's six, five and he needs to be 260. Like every once in a while, there's somebody who just literally needs the body weight. But for the most part, uh, even an athlete, like that's just not a great decision to throw on all that weight kind of out of nowhere. You're always better off losing weight slowly and you're always better off gaining weight slowly. Both these things, in my opinion, should be done. I mean, gaining muscle mass just takes a lot of time anyway, especially if you're trying to do it naturally. Mm-hmm. And this is where it's like, you, the body fat percentage anywhere between like maybe 13 to 17 and 18% is where a lot of guys, when it comes to being in the weight room, they're going to feel the strongest they're going to feel like they can perform the best um and that's why like i think that main gaining is a really good idea some guys some people don't like because they're like oh you're not you, you know you're not what won't allow you to train hard enough you're not eating enough mm-hmm. but the thing is that the, the reason why it's not popular for people and people don't like to do it is because it takes a lot of it takes time and you don't see the scale the weight on the scale go up as quickly so it's like if you're a 180 pound dude and you're like i want to see 200 for the first time you start eating 4,000 calories a day and every week or every two weeks, like two weeks later, you see 183. 
four weeks later, you see 185. Like, you're like, oh, shit, I gained five pounds in a month. You probably gained, like, two and a half pounds of fat <laughs> and two and a half pounds of muscle, maybe. Mm -hmm. Or even maybe, like, a pound of muscle and four pounds of fat. But, like, people like to see that scale go up because it shows, for them, it shows, like, I'm making progress towards that, that esoteric goal of 200 pounds. But main gaining is great because, yeah, you might not see 200 pounds soon enough. But if you're paying attention to, like, your progress in the gym, mm -hmm. right, and Every few weeks, you're going to see like you look a little bit better. Yeah, the body fat isn't going up a lot or the weight doesn't seem to be increasing super fast, but your body composition looks pretty decent as you're gaining weight. That's a good thing. Mm. And the thing is, it's like over a year period, maybe you went from 180 to like 189 or 190, but you have a similar body fat level mm. and a majority of what you gained was muscle that's better than seeing 200 pounds within four or five months, but you've gained quite a bit of fat and now you have to cut back down. Cause that's what most guys do. Yeah. What if you gain a quarter <laughs> inch on your quads and a quarter inch on your arms and your chest circumference is a little bigger and your waist circumference is about the same, mm -hmm. but you gained like 10 pounds. Mm -hmm. You know, that's kind of what you're looking for, right? Yeah. Yeah. And the thing is, is the thing also is you don't want to try to stay too lean. Because a lot of guys will be like 10% body fat and they'll be like, okay, it's time to main gain. I'm going to try to maintain 10%. But some people can perform really well at 10% if they've been there for a while and they've they been training for a while. They might naturally be a leaner person, period, right? Yeah. But some pe most, most people need to be a little bit higher in the body fat percentage. Mm -hmm. um, for me personally, I can perform well at 10%, but I've been 10% body fat for years now. Mm -hmm. Like for years now, Right. I don't need to increase my body fat percentage to be able to make progress. But when you're newer, most guys are able to going to be able to perform well when they're 13, 14, mm. 15% body fat. They'll feel better and they won't feel as depleted as they would be at 9 or 10% body fat. These body fat percentages that we're throwing out too, like you're probably going to look pretty awesome at around 12 to 14% body fat. Legitimately, you'll probably look pretty fucking good, especially if you're on the bigger side. Uh, if you're on the smaller side, then you might have to kind of continue to recomp until you have a little bit more body weight on you. But we throw these numbers around, you know, but 12% body fat. I mean, think about the people that you walk by in a in a given day, uh, you know, more so the men that you walk by in a day. It's going to be <laughs> really rare to see someone that's 180, 190, 200 pounds and 12% body fat or under. Mm -hmm. Really fucking rare probably, unless you're... Uh, unless you, you know, are, are hanging out at like a sporting event or something like that. That's the only time where you would see those individuals. But for the most part, um, people are walking around with body fat percentages way higher than that, which I don't even know where the, the body fat percentage would be because I don't think that people on the heavier side tend to even want to get their body fat measured, which yeah. is understandable. Yeah. And that's where it's good. Like you mentioned, you know, you want to get, you want to see where, are you going to see where your body fat is and then you're going to start cutting down or are you going to cut down and then check where it is? Uh, I probably check within like the next week or two. Yeah. And just kind of see where it's at and then, and then make a decision on what's going to be the best way uh, to get there. Um, I don't feel like uh, the body fat that I'm at now is hard to maintain. Um, the, over the last maybe a handful of days, I've been implementing a little bit more fasting. And so I want to kind of see where that will take me. Um, yesterday I ate like one and a half meals and had a, a, a full carnivore shake as well. But um, yeah, just, I think, I think it'd be really interesting for me to like bulk, which sounds so weird because I've never actually really truly done it. I kind of did Excuse it for <laughs> most of my bodybuilding career, but I was three thirty. I've never bulked. <laughs> yeah, but it, well, so here's the weird thing, though. Okay. This kind of falls in line with what Larry Wheels was saying, and we'll, we can play a clip from him. Is I never really did it in conjunction with bodybuilding. I got you. I only I did it in conjunction with powerlifting, which is just like, hey, let's get big and fat and lift more weight. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because in powerlifting, you know, it doesn't it's okay to have a little extra cushion for the pushing, and it's okay to have a little extra weight on you for a long time. That worked really well. Like it worked and worked and worked all the way until I just got too fat at some point. Uh, weighing 270 and 280 and 290, which those are tremendous amounts of weight. You look solid at 270 though. Yeah. Didn't you do that like BSN thing? Yeah. You... Yeah. I was able to hold some pretty good, some pretty good uh, yeah. amount of muscle mass for, for some of the uh, photo shoots and stuff that we did, which was a lot of fun. Um, but at a certain point, what happened was, is my 
uh, my body fat percentage was going kind of all over the place without me even really recognizing, especially kind of like through injury, yeah. especially, uh, you know, powerlifting isn't really, there's, there is a part of powerlifting that you do focus on hypertrophy. Um, but I was running into like injuries and stuff. Elbows were flaring up. So the activity wasn't as good. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's also kind of hard when you're that big, it's like hard to tell what's muscle and what's what at some point, you know? Yeah. So I was, I was kind of losing a battle that I, that I didn't even know I was losing. It took me, it only took me a couple of months to, to recalibrate and to see like, oh, okay, shit, this ain't working. We need to go, we need to go back the other way. And we need to do what we were doing in the beginning, which was a recomp. So every time I would compete, I would work on getting leaner and I would get on kind of a bodybuilding style diet or like a low carb diet and I would get leaner. I'd lose, you know, 10, 15, 20 pounds. And then I would restart and uh, get back into kind of like, a, I guess you would call it like a powerlifting bulk. But it'd be interesting to try to do like a bodybuilding bulk where I have the nutrition to support me, which I kind of felt like I did when I competed in bodybuilding. Mm-hmm. Um, even though that was kind of a short prep to the bodybuilding show. Yeah, there's a good shot. You know, one thing that the, the, on the nutrition side of things, because you don't, this thing, you don't have to track, but you got to understand the bodybuilders that are like, yeah, they don't track anything. They have six regimented meals that are mm. pretty much a lot of the same things almost every single day. Mm. So even though they're not tracking their food, right? It they ends have up- a meal plan. They have a meal plan. It's, it's a lot the same of- Same thing. It's going to be close to the same calories for their fat, carbs, and protein almost every single day that they're doing it, right? So whatever whatever way you do it, whether you choose to track your food consistently and just make sure you're, you're within that range or whether you choose to have a plan, that plan will still have a calorie amount, I'm assuming, right? And you choose to do that every single, like most days of the week- you still have to have regimented meals so you're not going crazy, mm. right? You don't want to add a crazy bolus of fucking ice cream here and there just because you can. Um, you want to be careful with that shit. Mm. Sleep is something we talk about all the time on the podcast because it's your biggest driver in terms of your health. And you sleep for a third of your life. So you want to make sure that your sleep is optimized and that you're taking every advantage to make that recovery period as strong and as effective as possible. That's why we've partnered with Eight Sleep Mattresses. It's the Tesla of beds. You can control the temperature of your side of the bed and your partner's side of the bed. And the cool thing is, over here at the podcast, we're all sweaty sleepers. Mm -hmm. I used to wake up in a puddle of my own sweat, and I can probably say the same for Andrew mm -hmm. and Mark. Mm -hmm. So that's a thing of the past, because now my bed <laughs> is cool. I wake up every morning feeling refreshed, and there's so many things that this mattress does and tracks that it is just ridiculous. So. Check them out. Andrew, how can they get it? Yes, you guys got to head over to 8sleep.com slash powerproject. And when you do, you'll automatically receive $150 off of your order. Again, that's at 8sleep.com slash powerproject. Links in the description as well as the podcast show notes. I think uh, like I think body like a bodybuilding method or technique is where it's at. And I think hopefully we see more and more people do it. We are seeing people like Peter Itia. We're seeing some other people starting to talk about it. And uh, obviously we've got people like Lane Norton, who's, you know, a, a PhD doctor, talks a ton about nutrition and he has been for years. And not only is he a powerlifter, but he's also done natural bodybuilding for years. So hopefully more and more people kind of get this, uh, hopefully more people understand it because having muscle mass, holding on to strength as we get older is super important. And one of the best ways to do it is through bodybuilding. As I was mentioning earlier, um, I did mention that, you know, some of the some some transformations I've seen physically from people have only been where they got serious about the food or they decided to take performance enhancing drugs. I have seen people tell me that they're like getting into bodybuilding. They're all fired up. They're super excited. And they're like, yeah, I'm doing the whole thing. I got the meals, uh, you know, starting. And they tell me the day they're like, it's, it's in two weeks. I'm trying to get used to the meals and all this stuff and the meal prep. Sure enough, six or eight weeks later, they'll look way different. Like you will look, you can you can look way different, whether it's a bulk or whether it's a cut. Wherever you are right now, if you follow a regimented bodybuilding, not just like program, not just the lifting, but the lifting along with the nutrition and the hydration, and you do that all encompassing and you do that for three months or so, you're going to look way different. Like you can't even... You can't even believe how 
crazy someone can transform in that time period. Obviously, the more body fat that you have currently, the harder the transformation will be, the longer some of that process will take. So, you know, if you're 60 pounds overweight, you're not going to all of a sudden see abs in 12 weeks. However, you're still going to have a crazy transformation in that time period if you follow a bodybuilding program. Yeah, 100%. Do you want to play that clip now? Yeah. Yeah, and mm -hmm. let, let's let's play that clip because this was this is interesting and it makes sense. It's from our it's from Larry Wheels, but uh, this is good. A lot of people God, are powerlifters. He is. Yeah, he's big, right? His freaking arms. He's fucking huge. Let's see here. Whole thing. Is this is post him gaining like sixty pounds in two days or whatever that was. It, I think this was before. <laughs> I think this is before. Uh, like he, this is still pre uh, pre show. Got it. Sure, it's a little snug. Uh, I, Probably doesn't matter. <laughs> no. Probably a 3X. With a two gram a week total cycle, I remember doing incline bank. Again, every week, struggling to grow my upper chest. Always, because I see what my flaws are. And one, the biggest one being the upper chest, right? It's just right there in your face, you know? And even on that much gear, if <laughs> you're not training correctly, like I wasn't, to grow my upper chest, it won't grow. But... <laughs> on TRT doses, which I'm on now, and <laughs> it's exploded <laughs> in just a few months, a few short months, right? Mm -hmm. A few short months. So, you know, when I see the comments years ago, and they say slow the reps, I'm like, shut up! Like I know what I'm doing. <laughs> shut up, dude. <laughs> yeah, shut up. You know, but now I'm like, damn, guys, should listen to you because I I just didn't realize how important it was. I just always thought it didn't, it just wasn't that important. I assumed. I just didn't have it in my genetics to develop Shit. my weak points, like my calves, my upper chest, triceps, hamstrings, right? These areas that need attention. I just thought, well, if this guy's I mean, worried about genetics, drink. we're all fucked. Yes. <laughs> that's, that's actually a, that's a hello. That's a funny fucking statement coming from him, right? Yeah. He's yeah. unbelievable. I mean, obviously, he, you know, I think sometimes people get genetics confused with somebody like just having it and just we're, we totally are aware that Larry Wheels has worked his ass off to get mm -hmm. to gain the strength that he has, but we've never seen anybody like him before. Mm -hmm. So it's a combination of him working hard and having awesome genetics. Mm -hmm. Larry Wheels is not just his genetics. That guy, he he's worked so fucking hard when it comes to lifting. Mm -hmm. So let's keep yeah. playing. Keep playing. This, okay. For so long, and it's, it hasn't changed, and I feel like I know what I'm doing when it comes to training. So I guess I just don't have it in my genes, but it's just, I wasn't training as a bodybuilder. I do have an argument for that yeah. though, that I, awesome. I think there. Yeah. So the, the reason why this is so interesting is because I think everyone has seen it where like people get super strong and they've been training for powerlifting for a long ass time. Usually only reps up to five, right? Five through one triples, singles, um, but they don't, even though they're super strong, they don't end up looking like a bodybuilder. Maybe they get bigger, but they don't have that look. And part of the reason is because of the intents of how they lift. The intent is huge. I mean, it's like, it's such a huge factor. Obviously, there are genetics that do play into it. Some people have, you know, different muscle fiber types and stuff like that. So maybe on sets of three, maybe this guy can get a little bit bigger than that guy. But that is super interesting. You know, you figure if you could handle 600 pounds, anything over like 300 pounds really on an incline bench is wild. Like that is some crazy strength. So you figure if you could handle that kind of weight that you would have some crazy upper pec development. Now, he's talking about a weakness in bodybuilding and his mind is probably, his comparison is probably to IFBB pro bodybuilders because he's Larry Wheels. He's kind of at the top of the food chain in terms of, he, again, he's one of the strongest people to ever walk the face of the earth. And so when he's thinking of bodybuilding and when he's thinking of his shortcomings in bodybuilding, uh, he's probably thinking like, oh, this is like a shitty chest compared to what Jay Cutler had and what Ronnie Coleman had. Um, but still, it is interesting that he wasn't able to develop it quite the way that he wanted to until he had the intent. A hundred percent. I see this. I see this from a, like a lot of lifters when they're lifting they're going through the motions of the lift. So when they're doing a dumbbell chest press, they're kind of just like pushing it up. They're 
doing it pretty fast. Um, there's there's no feeling of what they're actually trying to work. They don't let themselves feel that stretch at the very end. They don't let themselves feel that peak contraction at the top or when they're doing a cable raise. They don't let themselves feel these different areas. They just kind of go through the motions of the movement. And if you're not actually thinking of stimulating that muscle, fatiguing that muscle, and, 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 and using that muscle to do the work, you're not going to get the results you're looking for. Like he mentioned, slowing the reps down. He kind of looked at that as a joke. Well, what does slowing the reps down do for people? It allows them to feel what's actually going on. You're not just lifting weight. Now you're feeling the muscle group that's working and you're, you're focusing in on that. Mm -hmm. And if you can do that successfully while also getting probably going for higher reps, right? And fatiguing yourself at higher reps. So like you go for 10 good reps and maybe you only had 10 to 12 in the tank. So you're getting close to that failure. You're going to be able to start growing. Mm -hmm. Right. But after, yeah, after a bodybuilding session, you know, you'll feel wiped out. Um, but it's a different feeling and, and your, mu your muscles and stuff will be pumped, uh, depending on what muscles you worked and depending on how good you are at, at kind of activating those muscles, a powerlifting workout, you don't really feel the same way. You might feel wiped out. You might feel kind of fatigued. Um, but when you go to drive home, you might notice that when your hand on the steering wheel is like shaking, <laughs> you're like, it's like you just, uh, you gave an input into your nervous system mm. and it's a lot of nervous system training. I'm not saying that bodybuilding is not nervous system training because there's definitely an effect on the nervous system, but bodybuilding is more the muscular system. Like we're going to go in, we're going to dive in into the muscular system and we're going to work the biceps. We're going to work, uh, we're going to work the triceps. We're going to work the shoulders. We're going to work these different areas very like specifically. Whereas in powerlifting, you actually kind of want to run away from some of that because what bodybuilders are chasing is fatigue. Mm. And bodybuilders will chase fatigue so much that they do drop sets, they do um, uh, they do supersets, they do things where their rest period is really important. In powerlifting, the rest period's like, you just kind of wait until you feel good again. Mm. Uh, if that you're could newer, be five minutes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it could be, yeah, it could be 10 minutes. <laughs> And in a powerlifting competition, <laughs> people might not realize this, but 11, 12 minutes might go by before your next attempt. And you're kind of pumped about it. You're like, this is great. I get to, I get to be like, you know, it, it's almost, it's almost too long. Cause you're like, I'm going to start to kind of cool down if, if I don't get an opportunity to go again. And so with bodybuilding, bodybuilders are chasing fatigue. You're not trying to make yourself so tired that you can't lift any more weight anymore. But a lot of bodybuilders would do something called straight sets where they'll use the same weight on each set. And that's in, on purpose. Like they could use more weight. They could rest longer and use more weight. But that's not really the game for them. And we've seen the clip of uh, Kai Green. Uh, he's like, I'm not a weightlifter, right? <laughs> I'm not a weightlifter. And his point is, is that he's chasing after something quite different than what a powerlifter chases after. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've made the most progress um, ever just by like kind of ignoring whatever the the number on the machine or the the dumbbell was and just going for the uh like the sensation and chasing that instead mm -hmm. of like you know when i first started it was like oh i gotta if i want to get big i gotta lift big but i was cheating every rep you know like you were talking about like uh in, in a dumbbell press like just going for it like i would make sure my elbows were nice and tight you know and like i would like push the weight up and stuff i wasn't you know going out wide or i wasn't because if oh if i go out wide it's it's fucking hard and i can't lift the same amount of weight whereas now i'm like hold on let me like whoa if i go wider it feels even like oh yes let me give me the five pound dumbbells let's see what i can you know make out of that mm -hmm. um once i started ignoring the, the numbers on the weights the, the my body like the the physique totally changed yeah it's, yeah it's funny the like the amount of stimulus that like you're able to get from a lower weight when you're actually focusing on that muscle mm -hmm. group. But did you have a, like a similar experience to Larry when you started actually like, cause I know you, you've done bodybuilding mm -hmm. style stuff before powerlifting and even maybe when you were powerlifting, yeah. not that much, but when you really focused on it mm -hmm. and like how you've been training recently, or if you've been training with Kenny, have you noticed a difference even though you've been training for years? It can make decades. A, yeah. Yeah. It can make, it can make a big difference. Um, for me, um, on certain muscle groups, I would say it's like a little easier on some stuff. It's a little harder because, uh, I don't always have like the mobility to like really get into certain muscle groups, which is kind of an interesting thing. Mm -hmm. Um, and then also I have like damage, like I fucked myself up a bunch of times. So 
Um, my biceps are hard for me to get the sensation that I got when I was uh, younger because yeah. I tore them a couple times. Um, same thing was with, with pecs. But yeah, having a, a more central focused on bodybuilding makes a huge difference. And that's why I was saying earlier, I'd be interested in seeing what happens if I give myself the support from a caloric perspective because I've mainly only been like bodybuilding um, with like either maintenance calories mm -hmm. or some sort of calorie deficit or some sort of restriction. Mm -hmm. I haven't really messed with bodybuilding or done bodybuilding where I'm really diligent about like pre-workout carbohydrates, post-workout carbohydrates, kind of that peri-nutrition type thing along with just having just this, even just a small surplus of calories. So yeah, I'd be interested to kind of see uh, what I'll be able to do with that when the time comes. A topic that has been, and this is still within this, but something that's been kind of going around for the past few weeks, I've been seeing some posts from like Jeff Nippard and Omar Yusuf and shit, is people have been talking about, you know, power building, mm -hmm. um, where people will, you know, they'll have their strength movements and then they'll make sure to do their bodybuilding work at the end. People are starting to be like, oh, powerlifting isn't, uh, isn't viable or mm -hmm. it's not necessary or it's like a bastardized way of training. What are your thoughts on that first so off? Powerlifting or power? Power building. Okay, just making sure. Meaning like you're still focused on getting strength mm -hmm. on your big three or four if you had an overhead mm -hmm. press or any of these compound mm -hmm. movements. And then after you do that, you do your higher rep uh, bodybuilding type mm -hmm. movements. Powerlifting can be a lot of fun, you know? So just kind of having some numbers to uh, – to plan for and to go after, like it takes a certain uh, style of discipline. So I mm -hmm. think that whole setup can be really fun. It also can be really dangerous because yeah. you don't know what you're doing. Um, there, there's if you're trying to get big and gain size and be, you know, and uh, you're trying to pursue something in bodybuilding or you're trying to pursue something in aesthetics, either because you think it's fun or you want to be somebody on social media, you probably don't need to really worry too much about a squat. You probably don't really worry, need to worry too much about a deadlift. You probably don't need to worry too much about a bench press. And when um, you say that, you, you're, you're also primarily meaning the number on the bar, right? Yeah, the number on the bar and the very specific lifts of powerlifting. Gotcha, okay. But you're still going to want to do deadlifts. You're still going to want to do you know stiff leg deadlift of some sort, some sort of hip hinge. You're still going to, basically you need some form of squatting in there. And you need some sort of pressing for your chest, whether it's a machine bench press or whether it's dumbbells. So to kind of just, you know, pinpoint it down to powerlifting, I would say that, yeah, you, I don't think you necessarily need powerlifting in its most authentic form, but I do think that it can be beneficial. I do also think that if you were to take somebody that's, you know, 150 pounds and they're 5'10", you know, they're, so they're, and they want to be bigger. I do think that that powerlifting would be a great powerlifting would be a great thing for them to start to look into because uh, we're not just talking about we're not just talking about building muscle. We're talking about building the entire body and building your mindset and having a stronger uh, body, having more bone density, having stronger ligaments and tendons. Um, is going to build a tremendous amount of confidence. If you're 150 pounds and you kind of, I don't know, you've been picked on and so on, and, and now you can deadlift 275, like, you know, a couple of weeks back, you deadlifted 225 and your whole body was shaking and now you deadlift 275, you're going to be pretty fucking confident about yourself. You can gain confidence through other things. You can go to different sports and stuff, but uh, lifting weights is like one of the best ways to do it. And for that person that's undersized, the bodybuilding route is just going to take so long. It'll take forever. Mm. Uh, but to see some pretty good increases, to see a 30-pound, 40-pound, 50-pound increase in your deadlift, that can actually literally happen in a handful of months. It can. For especially like a newer person. So what an amazing feeling for somebody just getting into it who previously felt scrawny, they felt undersized, they feel picked on and so on, and now they're lifting a little bit more weight. That's going to do a lot for you. And then now you also, people lose lose this, lose this sight on the fact that strength is a fitness capacity. So be, now because you're stronger, you can handle more. You can, you can do more in your workouts. So somebody that has spent some time uh, 
bringing up their bench press and bringing up their deadlift and their squat, they're going to be able to handle more weight for more reps and more sets for more overall volume when they do decide to maybe hone in on uh, some bodybuilding more. Yeah. So the one thing to think about there too is like it's a lot of people do that because it's super fun. Mm -hmm. Like it's it's building strength with barbell movements is a fun thing. Like when you see your your deadlift go from 225 to 275, 315, then you're deadlifting four plates and you're deadlifting five plates. It's fun. You might not see the size gain you want to see <laughs> by getting that strong, but it's like it, it, it gives you like, whoa, I'm deadlifting this amount of weight now. Um, and that could be something, especially for, for lifters who are much lighter, that could be something that gives them uh, motivation because one thing I was thinking is like, yeah, they could get bigger without having to do any of that. But the thing is, is like the, 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 what they're going to be seeing over time is going to take so long and it's going to seem like such a slow process. And if they don't start actually enjoying the, the feeling of bodybuilding and seeing that like the small five pounds progressions every few weeks or maybe seeing the benefit of just increasing the amount of reps that they're doing on certain movements or wow, I'm able to feel this contraction way deeper than I was two weeks ago. If they don't feel like that's a fun way of progressing, then they won't maintain fire in the gym for that because you have no matter what you do you got to be consistent but the the downside of power building even though i liked that way of training and i did that for years is that your sessions if you're doing it the right way are long mm -hmm. if you're doing mm -hmm. compound movements a compound movement you're doing that to a top set or whatever um and then you're doing all your accessory work accessory work, you're doing your bodybuilding work, mm -hmm. your sessions could be like two hours. <laughs> like your sessions mm -hmm. will be usually like 90 minutes to two hours. Exercise number one could easily take a half an hour. Exactly. Whereas if you just hopped into the gym and your goal was just like hitting all these muscle groups, you could have a very effective session within an hour, an hour and 20 minutes. You could actually knock all that stuff out. Mm -hmm. So the thing is, is like, if you have the time, it's fun. But you got to have the time and you actually got to do it because most people, when they say I'm power building, uh, they do their compounds and their, their bodybuilding movements are half-assed, right? And then they're like, oh, why are my shoulders bigger? You don't really work your shoulders, dog. <laughs> like, like you don't work them. And for some of the guys that are maybe a little heavier, it's discouraging to not be able to see what the hell's going on. So if you're 22% body fat, you're not going to really see a vein. You're not going to necessarily see like a cut. But you might be seeing progress. You might be seeing that the weights are going up on the bench and you might be seeing, and then you can, you know, hopefully over time you can get some sort of handle on your nutrition. But that's another one that takes a long time. It takes a long time to figure out what to eat, how to eat it, how to cook. I mean, the evolution of my diet, it's changed so many different, it's changed so many times and it's changed from so many different things. Um, before I knew a whole lot, I would... Uh, I would just stick to like what I knew, which wasn't a lot, but I would just like make eggs all the time. Like that's kind of how it started for me. I'm like, I'm just going to make eggs. because I know eggs are like, eggs are healthy. I think they're supposed to make you big and I think they're supposed to make you kind of lean. So I'm just going to stick with these. And so I did a lot of that. And then I heard stuff about like uh, meat and chicken and shit like that and started getting more and more into it. But I used to like not cook my own meals. I used to, um, you know, get get food from wherever I could, like protein sources, wherever I could from a restaurant or something like that. And it was like a half ass way of like, uh, navigating some like, I guess like bodybuilding slash like bro, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, eating style. And then now I just, I cook every meal cause I'd rather not every meal. I do eat out sometimes, but I cook almost every meal and I'd rather know exactly what's in the meal. And I'd rather, you know, but that takes a long, you can't just ask someone to do that. You know, you can't just, you can ask them to do it, but like it, it's going to be rare that someone just all of a sudden flips a switch and, and they're doing that. Mm -hmm. It takes a long time. Power Project family, foot health is something that we talked about all the time on the podcast. And that's why we love Vivo Barefoot Shoes, but we love them not just because they are flat, flexible, and wide, but also they don't look bad. They look actually really, really good. These are their new boots. These are their Modus trainers for in the gym. These are some of their casual shoes. But when you look at a lot of barefoot shoes, some people get turned off because they don't want to wear those shoes outside. <laughs> and that's understandable. That's very understandable. But with Vivo, these shoes look so good and they're so good for your feet that they're almost a no-brainer. So 
Well, they are a no-brainer. Andrew, how can they get some of these kicks? Yes, yeah, so you guys got to head over to vivobarefoot.com slash powerproject, and you guys will receive 15% off your order. Again, vivobarefoot.com slash powerproject. Links in the description as well as the podcast show notes. What about on the uh, the other side? Because I think in SEMA you said like 12 to 17% body fat like is like a kind of like a good sweet spot where you'll you'll feel pretty comfortable and For strong. For most people. Most people. Um so like for me, I my body fat percentage was probably, you know, 18 and above, but I was still like 165 pounds. So this is the thing, when you started, right? Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. so what the thing is, is when you start eating enough food, when you're actually, when you're working out, you're burning calories in the gym and you're eating enough food to fuel progress. You said you were eighteen percent body fat. What probably I would is, say, yeah. So I'm I'm just guessing, yeah. but it it could have been even higher. Yeah, but that's the thing. What happens for newer people is a recomposition automatically. They mm -hmm. automatically recomp. If you're twenty two percent body fat and you just started training, and then you start eating enough protein, you start eating enough carbs to fuel performance, and you feel good in the gym, mm -hmm. you're gonna gain weight. But you, it's like this: the the first year or two some people like two and a half years is an amazing thing because you will start seeing weight increases and your body fat percentage will decrease a little bit. It's mm -hmm. like, that's when it's like, you don't even need to worry about main gaining because for the most part, you're going to be gaining muscle and losing body fat. You're going to have an automatic recomposition. It's when you start, like when you've been training for a while, right. And you've gained a good amount of muscle that you need to start being a little bit more careful with your nutrition. Like mm -hmm. you need to start paying attention to not eating way too much because now You've, your muscle gain is going to be slower and your fat gain, if you go way too high, you're going to be gaining quite a bit of fat because you've gained a good muscle, amount of muscle already. So for where you were, mm -hmm. that was a fine place to eat enough food because if you eat enough food, you're going to have enough energy to perform. You're going to be gaining weight, but a majority of the weight you're going to be gaining is going to be muscle if you're eating enough food. Mm -hmm. Your body fat's going to slowly go down and you probably would have found a sweet spot of like 14 to 15% body fat while continuing to train in the gym. Mm -hmm. Your body fat percentage is where now? Uh, it's like uh, I, I haven't checked it. Um, I think twelve or thirteen. But it was it was twelve and a half, um, like during the summertime. That's and great. So yeah, it's somewhere around. When one eighty five? Yeah, one eighty three, one eighty four. Yeah, I, I kind of top out at one eighty four, but it, it drops down to like one eighty one. So I'm, I fluctuate between you know about three pounds here and there. How do you feel now? You feel pretty good. Like yeah, I feel great. Yeah. Energy and all that. Yeah, the energy thing. Like um, I had mentioned on a previous podcast. Um, I just, I think I'm just, I'm kind of wrecked. Um, mm. So like I didn't go to jujitsu Monday and then I didn't train. What's today? Tuesday. Mm -hmm. Okay. I feel pretty good right now. I normally would have probably felt a little drained still. So I think I'm just like, I have to find the, uh, still find the right balance between going too hard at jujitsu versus like lifting and that sort of thing. How long has it been since you've taken like a week off? <laughs> uh, of jujitsu. Oh, Pause. <laughs> uh, uh, bro, the last time I got hurt, uh, no, the last time I got sick. So it's been a while, but I've never taken like, like, I feel good. I'm going to take some time off. No, it's always like, oh, I got sick. I'll just, I'll sit this out for a little bit. But yeah, that's, yeah, no, I haven't taken time off like that. This dude, this might just be the week too. Cause like, again, it's like you said, you haven't found that balance, but you mm -hmm. did have that balance when you're feeling great and you balanced that for a while. And mm -hmm. now you're feeling kind of drained. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's like the perfect week just to get pumps, go get a sauna session in, go cold plunge a little bit, feel good. And then start again next week. Mm -hmm. Cause I was having a conversation with a buddy, Arian recently. And he was like, he noticed, and I've noticed this for the past few years, the times when like you start to feel fresh in jujitsu are always like when you accidentally get injured or you're forced to take time off accidentally. And then you come back and it's like, well, I'm doing shit I've never done before. <laughs> but most people don't let themselves ever <laughs> have that, that time. A lot, yeah. no, it, it, no, it's a, it's a real thing. It happens to me all the time. Whenever I don't <laughs> go to jujitsu for like four or five days, mm -hmm. like it, whenever that happens, I come back, I'm like, ooh, shit's clicking. Mm -hmm. Like this is, this is, this is great. Think about how ridiculous that is too. Cause like four or five days, it's like, it's not that it's nothing. It's nothing to even really bring up, yeah. but it is something to bring up because everyone wants to go all the time. Yeah. I found the same thing with, with running. Like mm. I, I said, I just pulled back a little bit and now I have more energy even for the diet itself, which I think is really important. Yeah. And I'm not saying like I haven't missed days, but I haven't taken like that long of a break off to where it's like a scheduled thing where mm -hmm. it's like, yep, next week. All right. I'll see you guys the following week or something yeah. like that. You know, no, that's no, it's going to suck, but 
oh, just take the week. Just yeah. like still go in the gym, like do you know, move around yeah, yeah, yeah. and shit. But like, I think some of it's like that push pull thing, you know. Um you want stuff to continually pull you, you know. You want to be like you don't want to have to push yourself. Yeah. You know, you want to sail. You want to <laughs> just, you know, if you're a boat in the water, you want to just throw your sail up and go with the wind and like let it mm-hmm. you know what I mean? You don't want to have to like <laughs> You don't have to want to push everything so hard all the time. It's just, it's just, it's going to make things more difficult, and it's probably going to make make it harder for people to learn. Like in lifting in general, if you're pushing, 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 there are points where you do need to push. You do need to like. I think it's important, especially from a mental uh, perspective and a mindset perspective. It's mm-hmm. really important to to push here and there. But you push and push and push, and you're like, man, I'm pretty. <laughs> <laughs> You know, and that's where you want to see, like, how do I get the pull again? And the pull again is probably just to stop for a moment. Mm -hmm. And this kind of comes back into that bodybuilding thing, because for sustained progress in bodybuilding, I know some people are like, like, I, I, there's a joke about deload weeks being bullshit. And there's an aspect of sometimes they are bullshit, especially if you haven't been training hard enough. But Mm -hmm. there will come a point when you've been training consistently, you're on a four to five or six day Mm -hmm. split. And you've been going consistently hitting those workouts week on week. There comes a week where you go into the gym one day and you're just like, ugh. The next day you go and you're just like, oh, no, got it. Take that week. Maybe still go in the gym. Maybe get a bit of a pump. Do some different shit. But take everything lighter. Mm. Get in. Get out. Right? Do some recovery shit. Get some good sleep. Because if you just do that for a few days and you come back to the gym the next week, you'll probably be able to start making progress again because you're feeling fresh. Mm. Right, that's what happens when you don't ever really give yourself a little bit of a back off off of shit. Either injury backs you out, or you you get sick because you've been overdoing it. Mm-hmm. Right. But shit can happen, so just back off so you can keep progressing. Weights feel heavy. Mm-hmm. Um, kind of have like a brain fog. <laughs> um, hard to get a pump. Um, joints hurt. Like these are all signs, you know. These are all like. Just because you have like one of those symptoms doesn't mean that you need to take a week off. But Mm -hmm. if you kind of have a bunch of them and, uh, oh, and it's not fun. Oh, yeah. Yeah. If it's not fun, man, Mm -hmm. you need to go home. You need to to chill for a little bit because it'll be fun again. It'll be fun again. It's not like, you know, if I, if I miss running for two, three days, even if I was to miss it for a week, uh, it's not like, even though I'm still new to running, it's like, I'm not going to run again. Yeah. I'm just going to feel better. I'm going to feel, I'm going to be like, oh shit, why my body needs to run, you know? It, and so I think the same thing with bodybuilding, powerlifting, jujitsu. Uh, one thing I wanted to ask you and Seema is like, there's a lot of movements that just feel different, you know? So like a deadlift can be like a bodybuilding movement. I mean, traditionally people leave deadlifts in there, you know, for, for particular reasons, some guys will do like stiff leg deadlifts. Uh, we've seen Ronnie Coleman use crazy amounts of weight on mm. just like regular deadlift. And we've seen um, uh, Chris Bumstead. I think Chris Bumstead like deadlift 675, maybe mm. even for some reps. I mean, he's a monster. We've, see, we've seen people, you know, use these movements. But these movements aren't, you don't feel them the same way. You know, you don't feel them the same way you feel a tricep push down or like a lateral raise or like a crunch. Like if you do a bunch of crunches or you do a bunch of leg extensions, that shit burns. And it's kind of easy to, for someone to like do those movements and you can say, hey, that's, that's what bodybuilding reps feel like. But when you deadlift, it doesn't feel like that. Or sometimes like a bent over row, like I know that you, you, you know how to flex muscles in ways that a lot of people don't know how to do. And you're proficient at like a bent over row. But for me, like a bent over row, I don't feel, I don't necessarily feel my lats. But if I got stronger at a bent over row, my lats will probably get bigger. Mm. So the kind of question here I'm kind of posing is like, there's some movements where, and even a squat, a squat for some people, they're not going to really feel their quads on fire. They're certainly not going to, unless they're, again, unless they're proficient at squatting, they're not going to feel their quads the same way they would feel them if you just did a killer drop set on a leg extension. Mm-hmm. So while a bodybuilder is after a pump, uh, how do you kind of fit, how do you kind of think some of these other movements fit into the equation? I think they're great movements, but the thing is, is like when you watch someone like Bumstead or Kai Green or even Ronnie, when you watch them do these movements, usually they're not doing them in a powerlifting fashion. And that means they're not like just lifting the weight up. 
they're, they're not exploding with the deadlift. Or when you've seen Jake Cutler squat, mm -hmm. he wasn't just like exploding down into the hole and squatting up. There was like a one one. See, so bring up some clips, Andrew. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like pull up some Kai Green stuff or even yeah Cutler. But like there's like a one one thousand, two one thousand, three one thousand into the hole. Then there's a one one thousand, two one thousand, three one thousand up. There's always control, slowing mm -hmm. it down, feeling that like having tempo. But when you slow any of these movements down with the correct load for however strong you are, you're gonna you should be able to feel it in that muscle group. Mm. But if someone's like doing a row and they're just like, huh, just like rowing it with power, you can get that weight up, but you won't feel that load in the place that you're trying to feel it. So I think that all those movements are great if you're able to feel it. And if you can't, like, for example, whenever I did sumo deadlifts, my erectors were on fire. Like I loved that movement personally for my back and my erectors. And people are going to say, it's not a back movement. It's not that type of movement. But every time I got done, because when the way that I would deadlift, you've seen me do deadlifts mm -hmm. before. I sometimes would do deadlifts fast, but a lot of times you'd see me doing them slow. And then I'd always be controlling the eccentric of that deadlift. Mm -hmm. But then whenever I'd be done deadlifting, my back was just so, so pumped. My erectors were on fire and they were thicker. That movement was helping me out there, but it wasn't just because I wasn't just deadlifting, deadlifting explosively. Mm -hmm. That movement was still helping me grow because I was lifting that with intention. <laughs> so jacked. Yeah, and that's why some of these guys, that's why they like uh, Smith, machines, Smith machines sometimes because they can get tension. Yeah, look, Cutler has no, he's got no regard for like depth or anything. I don't think he cares. Nah. He's just like, let me keep my upper body, you know, kind of still. And I'm not, he's not bending forward a lot. He's just getting like a, knees are going forward. He's just getting some weight on those quads. Yeah. Two plates. But... <laughs> this is a uh, fast forwarded yeah. in the video. He did like fucking an hour of legs of different yeah. different types of machines and stuff. Yeah, Cutler did a lot of leg extensions and stuff beforehand to mm -hmm. get a, a better feel for his legs during the training sessions. But one thing to pay attention to with that squat is look how close his feet are together and yeah. how much more quad focused that squat is mm -hmm. versus a powerlifting squat, which is going to be focused on a hip hinge. You're going to be feeling that a lot in your glutes. You won't feel it that much in your quads, but his legs are close together and he's going right into his knees that you will your quads will fire up immediately right. right it's not the same type of squat yeah i remember uh we mark i don't know if you remember we used to call it the uh the death trap <laughs> we would get a trap bar but we would elevate our heels oh yeah that oh. would oh my gosh that oh, yeah. killed my quads i want to say that's probably like the best quad movement i've ever done yeah so that's and it's Josh supposed to be a, a deadlift right but you do, you feel it only in your quads because everything else doesn't matter when your quads are crying that loud <laughs> yeah you're not allowed to like bend your chest forward you got to stay upright the whole time mm, yeah knees brutal. far forward yeah that movement's great but yeah you're right even those old videos of uh coleman you know squatting 800 for some reps or um uh, in a regular squat, he's keeping constant tension uh, uh, on the muscle, and he's doing it much differently than a powerlifter. He's not just trying just to get through the movement. Mm -mm. Yeah, so those movements, like, I think those movements are great. You don't have to do them, but if you choose to do them and you want to build muscle, try to still, like, after your set, ask yourself, did I feel that? Like, did I feel those rows in my lats? Did I feel that in my back? Did I feel that in the place I'm trying to feel it? And if not, maybe you need to lower the load and maybe you need to slow things down, mm. right? And if you are utilizing like a bodybuilding protocol, you know, staying on top of those rest intervals is critical. So you're trying to do a row with like 315 or something crazy. If you can't keep up with the rest interval, the weight's way too heavy. If you can't keep your form, um, I think most of the time in bodybuilding, you're looking for like a technical breakdown. If you start to have a technical breakdown, the weight's a little too heavy. You want to be able to make it through all your reps, all your sets, with very little minimal technical breakdown. You're kind of pushing that as far off as possible, trying to have, I mean, you don't have to be like crazy about your form and technique. And I'm not saying that you can't have any body English because sometimes body English is sometimes what's needed for certain movements. It can sometimes be critical because it can allow you to uh, get a little bit more movement on a particular movement. But if you start to rely way too much on you know, the momentum of your body, uh, you're a lot of times you're starting to work different muscles and maybe you're not isolating the way that you want to. Mm -hmm. And I think that's actually a good thing, you know, from an athletic standpoint, from uh, a standpoint of, of maybe powerlifting, it's not a bad thing. But again, if you're trying to hone in on a particular muscle group to try to bring that muscle group up, 
you should stick within the rules and the laws of bodybuilding, which are to try to keep that form as tight and concise as possible. Yeah. Yeah. One thing that we're not, we shouldn't delve over and we'll, we'll come back to training stuff is sleep. Yeah. When, when really, uh, when Mark was talking about like, sometimes you do have to like push it or whatever, dude, I would get like the, the worst sleep, but like, nope, the, Guys on YouTube say I gotta push hard. I got, and so alarm's gonna go off at five a.m. So like let's let's get after it. And I made no progress. <laughs> Sorry, and mm-hmm. I just that's not, no, dude. You're yeah. Good. Like the, the thing is, is like if y'all work out at night, try to get yourself a non-stim mm-hmm. pre-workout. So a pre-workout mm-hmm. that doesn't have caffeine, because if you do work out at night, a lot of times you want to use pre, but then that pre that caffeine is gonna fuck with your sleep quality. And if you're trying to if you're trying to grow as much as possible, as mm. efficiently as possible, you don't want to fuck that up. You don't want to fuck that mm. up. You said you've been sweating when you've been sleeping. Yeah, like my eight sleep, I had a malfunction, so I had oh. to I had to get it returned, and uh, they sent me another one. Um, and for the five nights that I was without it, it was cold in the house. It's colder now in Sacramento. Mm. I, I had the AC on; it was like sixty nine degrees, but I was still waking up sweaty. My girl was still waking up pretty hot because like she's in prep. It, it was shit. Like I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a little, I'm a little spoiled bitch now because I realized, like, damn, like that thing was really keeping me cool at night. Every night I woke, I, I haven't sweat like that in a long time. You need a special like, blankie, yo, mm-hmm. dog. And it's back now. I got it back, but that, that fucking, that mad, that eight sleep makes a big fucking difference. It's huge. huge. Difference, yeah, <laughs> yeah, it feels amazing. Yeah, you don't so. want to be all sweaty. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But make sure that you're getting enough sleep each night because you know you you want your workouts to be productive. You don't want to, like, get, lack of sleep is going to be one of the biggest things that cause you to potentially get injured because you're not feeling as good or as strong or as, like, focused in the gym. So don't skip over that. Yeah, part of the reason why this came up is I had somebody ask me about peptides. And um, when they asked about peptides, I was just like, you know, I think a lot of times people are trying to take peptides as, like, a workaround to, like, not take steroids. But we've talked about it many times on this show. We've had a bunch of different guests on the show, and... The topic is always kind of complicated. Um, people are like trying to stay natural, but not, you know, they're trying to like get on something that is going to give them some sort of edge. Uh, and so they're hearing stuff about peptides from maybe from Dana White and Gary Brecca, or they're hearing about peptides from this podcast or other podcasts. I personally have not seen a peptide do anything drastic to anyone. Um, that doesn't mean they don't work. I might not have the information correct, um, but I've never, uh, currently, I haven't had any, I haven't seen anybody make some sort of drastic change and they're like, oh, I'm on this peptide. <laughs> I, I have never seen that happen. Um, I, what I have seen happen is people are on a mixture of things. They're on like TRT and they're taking peptides. They're on Let's make now make no mistake the about waters. it. Yeah, yeah. Make no mistake about it. Testosterone is a steroid, so sometimes people like get that confused a little bit. Mm-hmm. Doesn't mean there's anything wrong with it. <laughs> <laughs> but sometimes people are on testosterone and they're touting how good these peptides are. Again, I'm not saying that pepti- peptides don't work. I just haven't seen peptides make a real drastic difference in the way that someone looks or in the way that somebody lifts or in the way that someone performs. I wonder if I should start using peptides just to test this out. Yeah, and just to be like, you come in, you're 280 <laughs> and leaner. <laughs> Mark, you told me, you said they don't make a difference. This huh? shit don't work, huh, bro? <laughs> <laughs> um, again, what I have seen people make drastic changes, the same individual that asked me this question, if that person went all in on bodybuilding, in eight weeks, 12 weeks, we would see drastic changes. So yes. people might not, they might not believe it. They might not think what I'm saying is true, but it really makes a huge difference. The intent of bodybuilding, along with a bodybuilding lifestyle, not necessarily taking performance enhancing drugs, but having a lifestyle of getting the sleep and getting the nutrition in and making sure you're not missing meals. Remember, we had Chris Minnis on the podcast before, and he runs an entire uh, bodybuilding uh he runs bodybuilding shows out in Tahoe. And he said that he views it as cheating on your diet. If you miss a meal, Mm. like that's crazy, right? That sounds like crazy talk, Yeah, but these people are regimented and it's important that if, if you're somebody that wants to get big, if you're somebody that wants to get lean, 
it's important that you at least look into this. It's important that you at least give it a try. And I, the reason why, you know, part of the other reason why the topic came up is we're just seeing a lot of different stuff going on in the fitness space right now. There's a lot of movement stuff going on. There's a lot of people twisting and turning and, and doing cool stuff. And I am a fan of all that, but it's not bodybuilding and it's not going to get people. It can help improve people's bodies drastically. Um, but bodybuilding will get you there the fastest, in my opinion. Mm-hmm. Improving your sleep quality is as easy as shutting your mouth. And what I mean by that is putting some tape on, breathing through your nose will increase your sleep quality. It's no longer just something that only the bros do. It's now been researched and people understand that if you can breathe through your nose while you're asleep, you will have better sleep quality and you will wake up more rested. Hasha tape is also really awesome because I know what I used to do. I used to use a little bit of a cheaper tape. And every time I'd wake up in the morning, the tape would be somewhere else on the bed or on my face, but it wouldn't be on my mouth anymore. But Haas's tape, if you have a beard or if you don't, will stay comfortably on your mouth all through the night. And if you're someone who has a problem breathing through your nose, Hostage also has nose strips. So you can place those on your nose while you're asleep. Or if you want to be like one of those hormosy guys, you can wear it during the day. <laughs> Andrew, how can they get it? Yes, that's over at hostagetape.com slash power project, where you guys will receive an entire year supply of mouth tape and the nose strips for less than a dollar a night. Again, that's over at hostagetape.com slash power project. Links in the description as well as the podcast show notes. Yeah. It, uh, there's a difference between like, because like, a lot of people, they start asking about peptides or, or TRT, et cetera. But there's a difference between like, oh, I lift versus I, I lift. I train. I train. Because if you train, you're consistent. Meaning like each week on the same days, if you have a schedule for this, you're in the gym doing what you need to do. You are doing it consistently. There aren't like, and don't get me wrong. Sometimes you might have to take a, a, a day off of your split whatever it is, four or five days, whatever. But when you do that consistently, just like Andrew, you, you've been doing jujitsu four days, three to four days a week pretty consistently over the past year. Mm-hmm. You've made really good progress, mm-hmm. right? If somebody does that same thing when it comes to bodybuilding and lifting, within a nine-month period, they will be bigger. But the thing is, most people lift for a little bit, off, they get back into it a little bit, they take time off, something happens, and then a year later or whatever, they're not, they haven't made much of progress, if any, because there's just been too much inconsistency, right? So if you start this, train, like, like be consistent with it, take it seriously, look to try to make progress. If you do that and be serious about your recovery, you will grow. Like you will, no matter how bad you think your genetics are, you're going to grow. Mm. You might have to write stuff down. You might have to research stuff a little bit. You might have to write down the weights that you're using and then try to progressively use a little bit more weight. Um, You know, remember that the weight isn't the end all be all of everything because you can do more reps and you can do more sets. But the weight is an indicator that you are making progress. It can be fun to go from the 40 pound dumbbells to the 50 pound dumbbells and so on. So those are all things that you can kind of track and you can kind of see. And then I think uh, Insema has always done a good job of, of telling people to measure, like measure your waist, measure your arms, measure your neck, like whatever the areas are that are important to you, measure those. One hundred percent. Supplements. What do you guys think? I I, I think creatine is always necessary. Mm-hmm. Electrolytes will make you feel better during your workouts, depending on what type mm-hmm. of diet you are. But I think electrolytes are great. What else do you think are just like things that people should have? I think a protein powder can be yeah. yes. useful. Um, it's not like needed, but it can be useful. I think uh, it's can, super. Yes. I think it's needed, dog. Because yes. uh, well, usually eating all that protein yeah. is tough. Yeah, eating all that protein is tough for a lot of people. Um, and I, I've been, you know, down in protein shakes for a long ass time. I really, I like them. I, I like the fact that it just gives you a different flavor. You mm-hmm. know, you you might be eating chicken and uh, steak and hamburger meat or whatever, and then now you have the influence of something that's like sweet and a little different. So protein powder would be in there. And then uh, in terms of other supplements, I don't know. Mm, okay. I the, mean, I take, I, think, some, I take some like B vitamins and shit like that. I take, uh, I take magnesium. All right. Some of it's just like, you know, Merrick health tells me like kind of what to take. And I, I get that. So that's what I was about. Some to of say. it's in accordance to my blood work. Um, but there are people that believe that our soil 
doesn't have the minerals that it used to. And so it makes sense. That there's people that believe that everyone uh, should be on like a magnesium supplement. So mm -hmm. I supplement with that, but I don't even know if that's right necessarily. Mm. Get your blood work done. Cause I was about to mention, like I've started, uh, I had my blood work done a while ago, but I didn't start taking the supplements that Merrick suggested. So I finally was like, you know what? Like I know that I could be feeling much better than I am. I'm doing a lot of work. Let me start taking the suggested supplements. Because up until this point, I've been taking fish oil sporadically. I take creatine every day, protein I use every day. Um, I'd be using, uh, what is that? Uh, Fidogia aggressus every now and then. Uh, but Merrick, they, they suggested to me boron, P5P, magnesium, glycinate. There's a thyroid support supplement that I'm taking now, a fish oil supplement that I'm taking every day now. There's a few others, but I've been taking those for the past few days and I've already started mm. to feel like I've already started to feel nice. better. Like quite literally, because those, those, all the supplements that I'm taking right now are based off of deficiencies that I had in my blood work. Mm. Right. Um, and it's been like one thing I noticed, I don't know which supplements doing this, but I've been having vivid fucking dreams for the past five nights. Shit. And one thing that I didn't really realize is that I haven't been dreaming that often. <laughs> like that, 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 that's something I just didn't really think of, or maybe I've been dreaming, but I haven't been remembering. Right. But for the past five nights that I've been actually st starting to take these supplements that it's were a weird based off my blood. When you have like really a vivid dreams like that. Yo, dude. Like, what the fuck was that about? <laughs> Yo, man, I woke up mad the other night because like, I, I, I had a dream my girl was in the front yard naked facing <laughs> some other dude naked. And I was oh, like, hell no. I looked at her when I woke up. I was like, How bitch. How dare you? What the fuck? You're like, what are you doing? <laughs> I pulled one of those girl things. But <laughs> either way, like. <laughs> That's such a weird dream. <laughs> I know. It was odd. <laughs> it, was, it was quite odd. Dreams are yeah, so he was like some. Sometimes. He was a man with flowing locks. Uh, maybe that's it. Maybe it was an insecurity because yeah. of my bald ass head. Yeah, right. But he was the anti encima dude. He was white, sorry, jacked with long hair. There for a moment. <laughs> <laughs> I just pictured your girlfriend naked. I apologize. It's okay. Hey, she's hot. She's she hot. looks great. Yeah, she. It's okay. It's okay. I, I look at it as a compliment. I didn't mean to do it. <laughs> Fine, man. Right. <laughs> Fine. She wouldn't even take offense to that. She's she knows. She knows. But either way, like um, I think that's why I think it's important to get your blood work done. Cause like, you know, we I've been kind of just shooting a shotgun at what supplements are kind of good, mm -hmm. right? And they are good, yeah, but nothing was based off of my physiology. Mm -hmm. And it's I'm finally actually <laughs> Mm -hmm. Taking the shit based off my physiology. Taking responsibility. Yeah. I would say that, uh, you know, for people that are going to get into like bodybuilding, powerlifting stuff, they might want to look into having some aminos mm. during or around their workout. They might find that to be beneficial if you got the money for it. And some carbs. You know, people talk about like dextrose or uh, mm. highly cyclic, cyclic dextrins. Some people uh, are way, way big into that. And so those might be things that you look into as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I remember uh, when I was trying to, get big um i stumbled upon weight gainers Woo! so what is your guys' uh, thoughts on quote weight gainers as They're far as like powders awesome for making you gassy <laughs> <laughs> yeah a lot of times they just are loaded with like a lot of you know i'm sure things have changed you know uh i had a heavy weight gainer like 900 or something back in the day Ooh. from champion nutrition you know that was good weight gainer 900 yeah see if you can look it up it's probably like weighed like 10 pounds it, it had a laundry scooper in there <laughs> like like one of those yeah holy shit. yeah and he just scooped it right in and it just made you fart forever <laughs> it was just a fart factory from that thing it's like what the hell did they put uh, in there what was it called something 9, uh heavyweight gainer 900 i think it was heavy called. weight gainer i wish it was 9000 maybe it was 9000 9000 so much more appealing yeah. wow yeah. right imagine how much bigger you would have been if it was 9000 champion nutrition there it is I think those are great for people who just have a hard time getting in the calories they need to get. Like if you've been if you've been following and, and eating and, and just try, trying to eat and you just haven't been seeing any type of progress. Go get oh, that. that's not it's the nine hundred. That's not the original no, one. Oh, canister. Well, but okay. can be beneficial. <laughs> Wait, for, on, yeah, for people that it. for people that are having a hard time getting the calories in, but you could also just make a shake, right? Like yeah. you just throw some peanut butter in there. Um, but I do agree with what you were saying in SEMA about you, know, you got to be kind of careful with how you go about your weight gain unless that you don't it? care. Something like that? Like a fucking, looks like a laundry <laughs> Old thing. ass website, dog. Yeah. <laughs> oh my God. That's that sketchy. Showing. They're like, enter credit card here. I'm pretty, I'd trust them. Yeah, why not? 
Seven pounds. The rice and grind stuff that you that that like was oh. sent over your way has been pretty good. That shit's amazing. Yeah, it's really good. A lot Holy of shit, that's good. A lot of delicious f- flavors. I haven't tried the blueberry muffin one yet. That's one I need to take home. And the uh, th- there's one that's uh, taco. They have unflavored, but it mixes good with other food and stuff like that too. So I did mm-hmm. the uh, the maple one with uh, the cinnamon steak shake. Mm. Oh, dude, it was so good. It was amazing. Well, you, wait, wait, I you drank it, or what'd you do? No, right. I just I just made it kind of like oatmeal. Oh shit! So like I just I uh, I, I don't know. I put like a full scoop and a half mm-hmm. of the ri- rice and grinds. I always have a hard time saying it. And then I just put a little bit of water in it, mix it up, threw it in the microwave. Damn, mix it up a little bit more because it was still like pretty runny. And then after it was done the second time, I put a scoop of steak shake, the cinnamon cinnamon whatever I have cinnamon. Mm-hmm. Roll or whatever. Mouth yeah. is all tongue twisted. Mix that in with a little bit more water, and it was a party. Mm. It was so damn good because it was just carbs and protein. I'm just thinking about how good that'd be if you put some milk in there. Mm. Oh yeah, I'm like can, oh fuck. Yeah, if I had. I'd, yeah, yeah, you know. yeah. <laughs> uh, vertical diet. We talk about it all the time. Yeah. But vertical diet is a great way for people to learn about kind of how to eat and how to get big. Mm-hmm. I think Stan did a good job of. Um, just communicating with people on how important the nutrition is. Like nutrition needs to be nutritious. I think that somehow we forgot about that and somehow people are so worried about fat gain that they're not necessarily eating enough to make the progress or the gains that they want sometimes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The, 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 I think a big thing that you could just take away from this too is one thing that you can try to do during your workouts is instead of really shifting things around and totally doing a new program – Take almost every movement that you're doing and try to focus on feeling it in that muscle group. So that could be slowing it down a little bit and lowering the load, definitely. But focus on slowing the movement down and feeling the muscle group you're trying to feel it in. So that means with squats, maybe if you've been squatting low bar for the longest time, get yourself a, try to use a slant board or put some plates underneath your feet. Or if you have some Olympic lifting shoes, use some Olympic lifting shoes bring your stance in a little bit and and squat in the way that's going to, like you just saw Jay Cutler squatting. Yep. Squat in that high bar fashion that you're going to feel your quads. Because mm. one thing to think about is like, when you see Olympic lifters quads, what do you notice? They all have bodybuilder looking quads. Mm-hmm. Oh, Most thick. Olympic lifters. Yeah. But that's because of the style of which they squat. They squat driving the knees forward, kind of a narrow stance, and all that tension ends up being in the quads because they need to be upright for clean snatches, mm-hmm. all these movements. They have to be fairly upright. They can't allow themselves to come here and like mm-hmm. squat like in powerlifting. So think about that when you're doing all your movements. Slow it down, feel it in that muscle group, and lower the load. Don't forget about You'll the mirrors. Progress. Oh, yeah. You know, the mirror is a big one. Um, I think, you know, years ago, I think everyone was worried they'd get, like, made fun of if they're, like, kind of flexing in the mirror or whatever. But <laughs> part of bodybuilding is, like, you're trying to flex with your reps and your sets, really, is what you're trying to do. You're trying to, like, pose with your reps and your sets. And it's uh, it takes a while to, like, kind of learn all of it. And so sometimes you have to, you know, look at yourself in the mirror when you're squatting or doing certain movements. Or you might have to look in the mirror, like, after a set of leg extensions and flex your leg and start to learn how you flex certain muscles in your leg. Cause it's one thing just to kind of flex a quad, but it's another thing to kind of like flex the muscles that are uh, on the inside of the leg versus the muscles on the outside of the leg. It actually is way more complicated than, mm. than you might think. So you don't be, uh, don't be scared utilize the mirror. I want to mention, dude, I'm happy you mentioned that. Cause that's, I think that's a microdose habit that helped me be a better bodybuilder because I do that every day in terms like outside of the gym, like, um, like whenever we're standing here podcasting or just whenever just randomly I'm at home. hit a double bicep on somebody, <laughs> not, not even randomly <laughs> hit a double bicep. I'm just always like flexing shit in my like hamstrings. I'm like flexing a hamstring, flexing a calf, flexing certain things in my back, just, just to feel it. Because like when, when you get the hang of like actually activating those areas, it becomes much easier to access those mm-hmm. areas while activating them while you're working out. And that's something I do all the time. And I've been doing that all the time for years, but I think I've gotten so used to that I, I haven't realized that that is something that does help you mm. feel those muscle groups when you're in the gym. Like it doesn't mean you got to go be going like this, but like mm. I'm I'm always like t- like driving blood towards different shit in my body because that's just a habit that I've had. Mm. And I'm happy you mentioned that because I think that could make a difference. So just when you're not in the gym, just be like, can I access my hamstring right now? Like what? How how can I flex my hamstring while standing? Or what happens when I flex my quads right now? How can I access those areas? Mm. And as you start to think about doing that more, over time, you will be able to do that more. And then you'll be able to 
you'll be able to access and flex certain little things that you weren't able to before. But then when you go into the gym and you lift, you'll feel those areas mm. so much more with any type of load you use. It can be a fun little game. It really can be. Yeah. Uh, Rook, well, actually, two things really quick. Because um, you had mentioned the, the vertical diet. Um, yeah, definitely check it out. Or There's tons of information on everywhere online about the vertical diet. But I just remember Stan saying, like, okay, if you have your uh, – I forgot exactly what the quantities were, but like, like, let's say just like literally a cup of ground beef and a cup of rice and you weigh yourself. Okay, cool. Now do two cups of rice. Are you weighing where you want to weigh or do you want to weigh more? Okay, now do more rice or is it the wrong way? Okay, let's do half a cup of rice and go that way. So it was just like when he said it that way, I was like, I feel so dumb because of how simple you put it. You know, like, I was like, fuck, all right, well, I guess that's what I'll do now. You know, and I did, and it, it worked out just fine. Mm -hmm. um, and then the other thing, because um, when you're talking about, like, the power bodybuilding. Power um, building. Power building. And then you had mentioned, like, people do their compound movements, and then they'll go do accessories, and they kind of half-ass those. Of course. But what I, what I see is, like, somebody will do, like, a big heavy bench day, and then they'll go work triceps on the same day. And it's like. Okay, okay, like I get it, but wouldn't you want to kind of like preserve, like let's say the triceps for its own like lifting session or own day even? Because you just pro you probably smoked them pretty bad on the heavy chest day, and then you're gonna go try to fatigue them more on a tricep like push down or something. Is that something that somebody should try to put on separate days, or do you think it's okay to do that like kind of like the same muscle group going from like a heavy to a lighter but higher rep? I think it's okay because if you're doing a heavy push, um, you're not fatiguing your triceps that much. Like you're fatiguing your triceps when you do a heavy bench or a heavy close grip bench. But afterwards, it wasn't your triceps that were doing a majority of the work. It was your chest and your, your, your pressing muscles. So you were pressing, but after you get done, your triceps might feel a little sore, but they can do more work. Mm -hmm. Right now it's different if you were fucking doing heavy overhead, like, like skull, uh, crushers. skull crushers or something. That's a direct tricep movement, but you can still do like skull crushers, push downs, dips after. Like, that's why people generally try to put those on push days, right? Because you're working all those push muscles, right? So, I don't think you need to put your triceps on another day. But <clears throat> if they're a weak point for you, that's like, that's an idea of like, okay, maybe I can work them on this day and a few days later work them on one of my other days so I can get more frequency towards mm -hmm. that muscle group if they're one of your weak points. Yeah, it's interesting because you can you can do it like whatever way you want, but it is important that people recognize that when you are pushing, when you're bench pressing, you you are the triceps are getting worked a lot, the shoulders are getting worked a lot. When you're doing pulling motions, you're working your biceps a lot. So this is something to keep in mind. You can still train your biceps further on your back day. Um, I know some people that like to train their back and their triceps on the same day, and they like to train their uh, their their chest and their biceps on the same day. For the exact reason that you're talking about there, Andrew, because there is a slight fatigue uh, of those muscle groups, and it's a way to uh, get those muscle groups to maybe work with a different frequency, like you get to do it more times per week. So it really just kind of depends on the person, and uh, also depends upon, you know, always keep in mind, I try to mention this as much as I can, but so much of our weights come kind of via our elbow, you know, through our elbow. Our elbow bends a lot. There's a lot of pulling motions and a lot of curling motions and a lot of pressing motions and push down motions and overhead presses and so on. And they're all pull ups, push ups, dips. They're all like elbow derived. So it makes sense that people have, you know, elbow pain all the time. Mm -hmm. It makes sense why I said fuck your elbow because <laughs> it, it can get jacked up uh, really bad uh, during some of your workouts. So you might want to just pay attention to how much it's working as you were kind of pointing out in uh, that example. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, that's just another thing. Cause like I would, you know, follow the program that was written out for me. And yeah, I mentioned it before. It was like deadlifts, bent over rows, RDLs, mm. dumb, dumbbell bent over rows. And I'm just like, fuck you by the end, you know, I can't even move, Your but it's back is smoked. Yeah. And it's like, you, Okay, yeah, the back was smoked, but like at the end, it's like what other body parts am, or muscle groups am I using just to fucking try to, you know, <laughs> right? put a little body English on it to try to get the weight up. And it just, I don't know, the way I do it now is like I try not to use, you know, the same like muscle groups for multiple, multiple exercises in that same day. Try to do non-opposing muscle groups. Hell yeah. Wait, yeah. say that again? 
non-opposing muscle groups. So the typical push pull. So okay. like I'll work chest and lats or I'll do, uh, I don't know, let me see, like shoulders and calves. Like I won't, I won't do antagonist supersets. Yeah. I won't do like chest and then triceps right after, mm -hmm. but you know, I think the way you put it was very well said and makes a lot of sense. So mm -hmm. I won't be so terrified of it anymore. <laughs> so I'd like for people, you know, before they think about performance enhancing drugs or before they think about a peptide or, uh, before they think about taking this over the counter supplement that's legal, that mimics testosterone in some way, I think you should just mimic your training and, or you should pay attention, pay more attention to your training and pay more attention to your diet. And are you doing a lot of things that people that have gotten to be big have done in the past or people that have gained size or people that have made tremendous amounts of progress? Are you doing a lot of those things? Are you paying attention to your sleep, your training, your food? If you're not, I don't think, I understand the intrigue and I get it, but research those things simultaneously while stepping up your game with your training, your nutrition, and your sleep. One day we need to talk about Mike Menser. <laughs> not today, but that shit, people have been eating that shit up it's recently. Really yeah, I know uh, I Israel had a post about him uh, more recently. Yeah, we'll talk about it in a future podcast, but I'll just say this kind of briefly. I, I do think that you can get your workouts done in a brief amount of time, and I do think that you can get your workouts done um, with high intensity and without doing set after set after set. Mike Menser may have kind of jumped the shark in saying like he was such a big proponent of like one set. I mean, that's a little overkill, but um, there's ways of like making one set, you know, go on for a little bit, right? There's ways of making one, like you can do, like what I, one of the things I did in the gym today is I did uh, some dumbbell bench pressing. And after the dumbbell bench press, I did a, uh, I did some pec flies. And so that was kind of like one set. And uh, I did one warm up set of that. And then I did one regular set of that. So I kind of really just did one set when it comes to chest for that particular movement. I did a bunch of bench pressing and stuff before that. But I have a lot of workouts where I'll do what I would call like one set. But again, a lot of times it's like I might do leg extensions and then do walking lunges. And I consider that to be like one, it's two sets, right? <laughs> or I might walk with sled and then do a ton of hamstring curls. It's kind of like two sets, but it's, it's a circuit. It's a circuit mm -hmm. and it's done in a short period of time. Um, a lot of times I don't want to lift. There's, there's days where I could be in the gym for an hour and a half. And there's days in the, in the gym where I, I don't want to be in there that long. And so I think it's important for people to understand that you can utilize whatever methods you want. Um, Israel kind of saying that he doesn't think these methods work, I think is ridiculous. I think these methods do work. They've been around for a long time. A lot of people have used them. So, uh, okay, maybe the research isn't exactly on point with, you know, doing this amount of sets or whatever, but a lot of people have utilized it. It seems to be working for people. If it's getting people to move, it's getting people to exercise, it's keeping people excited and they're making progress and leave them the fuck alone. Yeah. We got to talk more about it. <laughs> Strength is never weak. This week is never strength. Catch you guys later. Bye. Getting big and jacked. That's what we just talked about. But how about improving your aerobic capacity? Part two with Chris Hinshaw. Check this Ooh. podcast out. You want to get a bigger engine? You want to improve your endurance drastically? This man, he knows all. Enjoy this podcast.